Teen Centric. Teen Centric. You're listening to Teen Centric. Teen Centric. KPPQ LP Ventura 104.1 FM. Hello, welcome to another episode of Teen Centric. I'm your host, Craig Rosen. Thank you for tuning in. Today's show, the guest that I'll be speaking with is one of my students from Juvenile Hall, so she will remain nameless. Um, she was primarily there for drugs and has since been released. I'm here with one of my poetry students, Judy. Hello. Hi. Would you like to tell the audience how old you are? I'm 18. You're 18. All right. How's that feel? Oh, uh, horrible. Responsibilities. Oh, right. Is this your first time in Juvenile Hall? 13th or 14th. Is it always this one, or have you been in some other facilities? No, just this one. How has your experience been 13 times here? They've always been good. They have? Never had problems with people, but I always stick to myself, that's why. Well, that's probably in some ways smart. It is. I've talked to kids who have been in this particular facility, and they've also experienced time in other ones, and they frequently will say how much nicer this is, and that there's a lot of good things here. Can you talk about some of the different things you're able to take advantage of? Yeah, well, this place is just really clean, that's one thing. We get blankets once a month, and there's a pony program here, and we go out and we do the ponies, and we do obstacle courses with them. Then there's leaders, which you get to do radio programs, screen printing sometimes, and you get to do life skills, which teaches you how to like get a job and just everything you should learn how to do in life. There's also the dogs program called Positive Steps. And then there is landscaping, which is good too. You get to harvest and plant plants. I heard there's a guy that teaches poetry. Oh yeah, his name's Craig. He's all right. <laughs> he's all right. No, cool. he's cool. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that there might be a story in you or at least a poem or two. We've talked about that. Yeah, I was yeah. thinking about it. You were? I just never put it down on paper. It just didn't happen yet. Let's just say yet. 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 You know, there are people out there that wonder, like, you know, what happens when oh, you go to juvenile hall? I was talking to somebody today about teaching here, and she was like, well, I have to just be honest. Is it going to be safe for me in there? And, I, you know, for those of us that have been on this side, you realize this place is pretty chill, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah. So, but she didn't know, you know. They're kind of curious. And so um, when we were talking the first time, I thought that, like, hey, you know what? That's impressive that you're, like, comfortable and sort of seems like you're at peace mm -hmm. to some degree with some of the things that have happened and some of the choices you've made. Yeah, I am. Is that fair to say? Yeah. So, like, the first time we talked, you did tell me a story when you were, what was it, like, 14? 15, I think. 15. Mm -hmm. And it was in your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Just across the street from my house. Right. Then you want to tell that story again? Okay. So I was with my brother and two of his friends. And we smoked weed. And then I was go I just got really high. And then I was walking back to my house. And this person's house is just across the street from my house. A couple houses down. And there was this guy out there. And he told me, oh, come over. And so I came over. And I was just like not really thinking anything about it. He told me, come inside. We'll have a few drinks. And I was like, all right, cool. I'm just across the street from my house. I'm right there. I can see my house. So I go inside, and then, like, nothing was really happening. So, But we went inside the guy's room, and nothing was really happening. So then I go to leave, and he's like, no, 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 you can't leave. And then so I was sitting on the bed after that, and then he got on top of me. And then when I tried to go to get up, he wouldn't let me. And then we had sex. And then when I went to go leave, when he let me leave, he said, wait, and then he gave me $100. And then he walked me outside the house and told me if I wanted to come back later, I could get more money. And you were at the time 15. Mm -hmm. Totally mind-blowing. Yeah. Um, you were walking home without your brothers at that point when you left the party early? Yeah. Well, they went this way. They went one way. I went the other. I see. Trying to go home. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so then there was a part of you that I think you told me that there was a call you made, but it wasn't to like... Oh, yeah. Well, because I had been in rehab when I was 14, and then I made a call to the rehab because I liked the staff there, and I wanted to talk to somebody because I was, like, crying. I didn't really, like, I don't know. And so I called her, and then I was just told her what was going on, and she's like, all right, like, you're okay, just calm down. And then when I felt better, I got off the phone with her. But then she had called my dad, or my mom, and then my mom had called my dad. And that then, happened later. Yeah, that happened later. And you were hoping that wouldn't happen. I was hoping that wouldn't happen. Right. You were just going to not tell your parents. Mm -hmm. And your feeling was 
that they would blame you or they wouldn't handle the information that well and you were okay? I just didn't really need... I was living with my dad. Or, or I was at his house at the time. And I just didn't really want him to know. Because I felt like that was just kind of personal. It's personal. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it's... As I said the first time, I think it was like a good instinct on your part to call a counselor like that. Mm-hmm. You know? I just need somebody to talk to about. And I didn't really have many people to talk to about. To talk to it about. Yeah. But, you know, a lot of times people might feel like they need someone to talk to, but then they also just go the other way. They shut down, you know? So there's a lot of times people have ideas to do things, but they don't do them. Did it help to talk to her? Yeah. It felt good to get her all out. Uh Uh-huh. You said that that experience kind of led you to some different pathways from that point. Yes, it did. How so? Well, when he had given me money, he gave me money and then I guess, like, I used to start, I used to hitchhike a lot. Just ask people, hey, any chance you're headed this way? And then I would get a ride from people. And then they would ask me, like, oh, um, are you working? And so I would just do sexual favors for money because I realized, like, by doing that, I could get money. Right. Were you, the first time that you were looking for a ride hitchhiking, thinking that that could happen? Or was it that somebody approached you and said that that made you think, oh? Somebody approached me with that question. I see. Was that before the the thing had happened in your neighborhood? After. It was after. Mm -hmm. So I think you were saying at one point that the fact that that experience happened and you came through it made you think like, oh, I could do this. Yeah. Right? But you also told me that you have your own sort of classifications of people that you will or won't ask a ride from. Oh, yeah, I do. I don't ask, like, really young people because I feel like they just don't really want to waste their time with other people or waste their gas. And they're more cautious. I only really ask guys, older guys. So when, when I had a boyfriend, I would just ask, like, I would ask, still I would ask those certain peoples for rides, but I wouldn't do nothing with them. But then, like, when I was free, when I was single, I would just, it was more like, all right, if I can get a ride and make some money, I'd rather go with that. Instead of taking longer to ask somebody for a ride and not having to do that. Did you tell me that sometimes you really never felt nervous? Sometimes I just didn't really feel nervous. It was more like, this is just, I'm just going to do this and I'm going to leave. That's how it was. It's normally, it's really just like a part of life, my life. Do you think that the fact that it was in this sort of automobile setting would be different than like people that are walking on the streets looking for oh yeah because it's like I choose they don't choose I choose and if somebody asks me like oh you need a ride or something I won't get in the car right so in that way you feel a little bit more in control yeah do you feel a lot in control no I mean they're the driver so that gives them more control but you also said that you had kind of like a, a sort of opening line Oh, well, yeah, I just tell people, like, well, um, if I see somebody getting out of the car, right before they go into the store or whatever, because it be posted right before the 7-Eleven, and they get out of the car, and I just say, hey, excuse me, any chance you're headed this way? I need a ride. And that's just what I'd say. And that's just how it works. Yeah. yeah. And they tell me yes, or they tell me no, and if they tell me no, then I move on to the next person. Right. If they tell me yes, they go get what they need to get in the store, and they get out, and then I get in the car. Did you ever meet anyone who also was... um? doing something similar or engaging in that kind of activity that you ever could talk? No. No. It's just kind of you and your thing. Yeah. I see. And um, how long have you been doing it? Mm, Since I was 16, two years. Okay. But I've been like hitchhiking since for like two and a half years. I see. And never had any violent experience happen? No. That's good. Mm -hmm. And you don't honestly worry about that? Um, well, in the beginning, it never really came to my mind. No? Yeah, not really. Until, like, someone would start bringing it up, like, this could happen, this could happen. Or even people that I'd get in the car with would say, you really shouldn't get in the car with strangers. Right. But you felt like I, I kind of checked you out. I mm-hmm. picked you. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. But we all know that people can surprise you. That is true. Or were you, in some of those situations, 
always in the back of your mind having like a flight plan or an exit plan or looking just to be safe about how I'd get out of this car or what I'd do to this guy if something happened? No. You weren't? I mean, if anything, it came to my mind maybe like once or twice, just get out when it's like at a slow, like going, the car's going slow, right? I'm, I'm at a stoplight or a stop sign if I needed to. Right. And then you always had the person who was driving be the, the one that would pick where to drive to for that? No, I picked. You knew? Yeah. Spots? Yeah. And how had you seen those spots? Because um, somebody had once taken me there before. Oh, I see. So the first time, mm-hmm. you didn't have a spot in mind, but no. then because of that... Yeah, because of that, I chose. Were these sorts of things why you ended up in the halls? Mm, no. I, sh- I started coming here for drugs, like because I'm on probation, so if I tested dirty, it was normally the reason why I'd come in here. Right, I see. Okay, mm-hmm. so you've been struggling with that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know... We've talked a few times just about how I see in you this intelligence and this world awareness. I mean, obviously, some of these experiences you've had, you've got to be thinking, though, that there's like, okay, I have a brain, man. i got to apply it to some things. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, like, what sort of thoughts come into your mind sometimes about, like, other paths? Other paths? Yeah. Do you think about well, that? Well, when I'm in here, I do, but usually when I get out, I just do the same old thing. You're thinking, like, because it's been easy to do that, that's one of the reasons you go back to it? Yeah, I like it. I mean, I like getting, I like making money. You like making money. Yeah. And that is a very easy way to make money. So then, we also talked a little bit conceptually about the larger picture. Like, there are definitely some societies where sex business is legal, sex mm-hmm. work is legal. Do you feel like it should be legalized? Yes, no. Yes and no. Yes, because for the, like, the female part, at least we won't get brought in to jail for this. And then no, because like men could say, like, no, I was paying her. And what if they weren't? What if it was just like... An attack? Uh, yeah, an attack or a rape, yeah. Okay, although... Um, give people a way to justify it. I see. That's interesting. All the men pretty much find ways to justify rape all the time. They just blame it on you guys. Yeah. Interesting that there was a part of you that thought no. Because wouldn't that make your life a little bit easier if it was? Yeah, it would. You know, you you like to think that people are safe. You know? Why do you think in this country people have such an attitude about it? I have no idea. People have always been frowning upon women that have sex. That's true. With multiple people. But really, it's just, well. Men do it's it. It's a job, and men do it. Men don't get frowned upon. Men get proud, like, praised for it. Right, it's a double standard, for sure. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of judgment in it. But really, it's just a job, it's just business, it's a way to make money, and it's easy, so nobody should really be judgmental about it. Do you feel like you are sometimes torn about it? Whereas if it was legal or if people weren't judging, then you'd be like, well, that's definitely what I'll do. No, I still, I mean, even though people judge me, I really don't care. Because they're not the one living my life. That's true. I'm the one making the money, not them. Right. So it just seems like a pathway to... It just seems like an all-around easier way. Whether I'm doing good or whether I'm doing bad, even if I have a job, I mean, I haven't had one before, but even I feel like if I did have a job, yeah, I'm making money a healthy way. But like, what if I need extra cash? I'm still going to go back to that because it's an easy way. It's an easy, quick way. I see what you're saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you've yet to have a job, but you're thinking that you might? Yeah. You're interested in anything in particular? I don't know. I was thinking grocery store. Okay. Do you like to interact with people, though? I'm good at it, but I don't like to. You don't like to. So you'd rather be, like, stalking? Yes, that's what I want. Oh, that's what you want to do. And that has, like, midnights, graveyard shift. I could do that. Do you like the graveyard shift idea? Yeah, because I'm awake anyways. Those are the hours you keep? Yeah. Night owl? Yeah. That's cool. All right, G, well, how's this scene so far? Was it different than you thought it would be? Um, a little bit. You were yeah. kind of nervous, right? I was nervous. You were nervous. I think you did really well. I feel better. Oh, good. I feel like I talked in a, like, a bad way, though. Like, my English 
was not. You strike me as thoughtful. Thank you. Um, so now we just have to get you to, to write. write. Yes. So I can publish you in one of these poetry books. Yes. And then the other thing we would do with this interview is I'd have you read one of your poems. So oh, there's yeah. still time for that. That'd be cool. Let's get you writing one. Maybe. Oh, make a promise. Oh, no, I don't do those. <laughs> you don't do those. All right, well, thanks for talking today. Thank you. This is KPPQLP, Ventura 104.1 FM. My guest was released soon after doing the interview with me, but then she returned to Juvenile Hall not long after for, as she indicated earlier, testing dirty. And upon her return, I approached her again about writing, and this is what came about. The first time we sat down and talked, you didn't know for sure if you were going to write. Oh, I didn't think I was going to. You hadn't done any writing, had you? No, never tried. And now you did? Yeah, and I like it. And you like it, that's great. This one's called Numb. I'm a quiet person, but not because I don't have nothing to say. People don't listen to me, as if they can't hear me, or they just disregard what I have to say. Sometimes I yell to be heard. I don't like that. I have much anger built up inside from bearing my emotions. I'm not violent. I don't express anger physically. I rarely talk about how I feel, because I don't trust anyone. All I feel is numb. I get mad easily and feel hot. I need to walk. I ball my fists. My left eyebrow raises. I want to need to scream or cry. I'm holding so much inside. My heart trapped in my throat. So... Is that something that you feel a lot of the time, or some of the time? I was feeling it a lot, all of the time, actually, until I came in here. Now I'm feeling less, like, traps in my body, my emotions traps. Okay. I really like writing with you because you, like, can tell me what exactly, you can tell me what to write about or give me a prompt and it helps me. And it's easier when I just write what I feel instead of trying to turn it into a poem, because that's why I thought I couldn't write in the first place, but I can. I like to express myself, it's easy to express myself, and this makes me feel better. And seeing my like work come back to me, I like it. Have you surprised yourself a little bit with this? Oh yeah, I have. With this long one, my family, I surprised myself with that one a lot. How so? I just, I mean, like, I was never sure if I could get all of these things on paper. And then when I did, I was just, it felt good, but I wasn't sure how I would, like, transform it. I've always felt these things like deep down, but I never really wrote them or talked about them. So to get them out feels good, but I didn't know I would write all this. My family. I'm a happy girl until I start thinking about what's important. My family. I love them so much, but my actions don't show it. My mom helps me from a distance. When she cries, I cry. She won't get any closer. Signed off on me at 15. Said she's starting to accept the way I choose to live my life. That hurts a lot. My dad took me in at 15. We lived in a small garage. He tried to give me the space we didn't have. Cup of noodles and TV dinners, that's what I ate. While he worked every day and came home late, he texted me to make sure I was safe. My dad has my heart. I'm lucky to be his little girl. I need to work on my future. I want to have my own things. A house to go to and be safe in. To hold down a job and have a hobby. Someday make a family. Honesty and trust are important to me. If I talk to you, it means I trust you. If trust gets broken, I step back. I need to be careful. My words are honest. If you ask me something, I answer truthfully. When I'm lied to, I feel hurt. I want to know why. My friends keep me moving. When I get stuck, they're there for me, when I'm doing good or bad. I can talk about what's going on in my life. They make sure I get sleep, ask if I need food. We take care of one another. I love them. My family. I love them. My family. I love them. My family. Thinking about these things can hurt, but they're important to me. I like that last line because I think it really sums up what this kind of poetry writing is often referred to as confessional poetry, you know, and you can understand where that comes from. Yeah, I do. I confess a lot into my poems. I like to do it because it helps me like, just get everything off my chest. Yeah. Do you think that it also helps you to kind of like understand your emotions or just, you know, to be getting more in touch with them by having to like grapple with them? To get more in touch with them, yes. There's a lot of um, references to some real basic survival things in there. You know, food, sleep, safety, having a roof over your head. Um, there were times in your life where that's, that's been in question? Yes. Being on the streets and everything. Not having a place to go. So how, you've been on the street for days, weeks at a time? Months at a time. Months at a time. I think three months was the longest. 
for people who have never experienced something like that, can can you explain to them how that happens to some teens and just what what goes on? Well, how it happened to me was just I my dad moved away, my mom moved away. I turned 18, I didn't have anywhere to go, and I was just couch surfing. And it's hard and it's scary, and you have to learn how to live in the streets because it's different, totally different from like having somewhere to go and having people there with you. You have to watch your back every second because somebody will take your things. Somebody like can do some bad things to you. You have to be careful when you're sleeping. So before you turned 18, you were still living with one parent or the other? I was living with my dad when I was 16, and he kicked me out when I was 17. I was just like officially by myself when I was 18. Oh, okay. And then you were saying how with your mom, there's you're still kind of working on that relationship? Yeah, we're better when we don't live in the same house together. Um, are you pretty open to the fact that maybe things can get better with you guys? It will never get to like where I'd like it to be, but it will be better than how it is right now. That's good. You talk about wanting to make them proud. Yeah, I do. I don't know if I can. Well, the fact that you want to and care, I think, is important. Yeah. I've met a lot of people who seem to give up on family. That's always sad. No, because I don't want them to give up on me. And when she says that she accepts the way I'm starting to live my life, like, that really hurts. It what sucks. Do you, what do you mean by that? I feel like to me it just means, like, she's just giving up hope on me, and I don't want her to do that. Right. Do you want her to believe that you'll put it together? Yeah. I think there was a time when you were talking about, like, middle school years or some of your early years, and were you saying cheerleading and stuff? Oh, yeah, I was in middle school. I only did it for a year. It okay. was fun. So how do you describe the pro the progression that happens when, like, you're doing cheering and things are kind of a little bit better, and then they go south? Everything was good up until, like, I think until I just started seeing somebody, and me and my mom just were arguing a lot, and that's really what changed was we were arguing so much, and I just moved to my dad's, and that's when everything kind of just went downhill when I was 15. There wasn't as much structure, it sounds like. There was no structure at my dad's. He was always working. I got to do whatever I wanted to. If I did school, he only got a phone call, and it was he couldn't really do much about it. He always said he, was ne he can't tie me to a bedpost. I see. And so would you say you just started hanging around different people, too? Was that part of it? Yeah. My first time here, I started hanging out with people, like, that bang and everything. And before I even came here, I was just always with my boyfriend, and all we did was drink. Yeah, that usually doesn't lead to too many productive activities, right? It did not. If I didn't live in fear, 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 fear. If I didn't live in fear. If I didn't live in fear, 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 fear. fear. If I didn't live, if I didn't, live, if I didn't live in fear, I would break up with my man. If I didn't live in fear, I would leave Ventura County. If I didn't live in fear, I wouldn't hold back what I have to say. If I didn't live in fear, I'd try to be sober. I live in fear of the effect I have on others. I live in fear of judgment. I live in fear because change scares me. I think about being judged. I think about having a better life. I think about my actions. I think about being happy without the drugs. I want to prove my family wrong. I want to make my family proud. I want to stay a good person. I want to help others. I need to help myself. I need to help myself, self, self, self. Need to help myself, self, 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 You have a pretty good sense of your life, though, and a sense of, you know, there's a right way and a wrong way instead of just like, there are people that I think, bang, they're affiliated, and they adopt a code that embraces the lifestyle that, you know, is criminal. And that's kind of what's going on for them. Um, I feel like that's really not the case with you at all. Even if you've been here as many times as you have, you see yourself doing something else. Is that true? Yes. I want to get better. Every time I come in here, like, every time I go back out, I do something like that's better than what I was doing before. So making little progress. That's good. Marking it, seeing it. Mm -hmm. I feel like writing things down, think, like, you know, you wrote in a couple of your pieces the things that you want to have in your future and... It's really good to visualize that stuff and to put it out there. Would you like to read another one of your pieces of writing? Yes. Okay. This is Looking Back. I love you and I thank you for the love you gave to me. You took me under your wing, stayed with me every night, showed me wrong from right. I needed you. I was new to living on the streets. I didn't know everything. You made me grow up too fast. Have the mind of a 27-year-old, but I don't. 
I learn at my own pace, make mistakes, learn from them. I thank you for giving me the memories of you and I. I love you. Nice. So that was somebody that you used to be with? Yeah. And um, is it, does it help to be able to like reminisce about things like that when you're here? Yeah, it does. I like to think about it. Mm -hmm. And this makes me feel better. And seeing my like, work come back to me, I like it. I let it out on paper, but that's different than talking to people about it. Oh. Letting it out on paper, it just only I can see it. Okay. But, you know, we're talking about it right now. I trust you. Well, thank you. Does it feel good to talk about it? Yeah, a little bit. Sometimes I feel weird. Like okay. I'm opening up because I don't know where it will go. Right. But as far as getting in touch with what you feel, so you're putting it on paper, mm -hmm. so you do that on your own. Yeah. But then, like, you know, you told me that in the past you were there was, like, a counselor that you were working with. Yeah, I've been in therapy, like, ever since I was in third, fourth grade. Okay. Do you see the value in it? No, I don't like it. Oh, you don't like it? No. Because okay. I did never trust the therapist. That's interesting. Um, do you see conceptually the idea that talking about things that are difficult and hard to face is maybe helpful, though? It is helpful. It helps to let go. It really does. Well, I like to write about. I like to write about how I feel. I just don't always like to talk about it. Oh, okay, so yeah, this part's hard. A little. Okay. Well, it's going okay though. Thank you for being brave. As a writer, do you feel like you've improved? Yeah, I think I've improved. I think it's easier for me. Like now, I understand. Like, don't try to think about what you're gonna write. Just write how you feel and let it go on paper, and you can figure it out after. You want to talk about what it feels like as you get close to release? Yeah, it feels like you're nothing, actually. It really, I don't feel like, a lot of people don't feel like they're getting out until like they actually, that day. For me, I've done three months here now and it's gone by really fast. A lot of it was, like, some of it was hard, a good three weeks of it, but time goes by fast in here. And I don't really feel like I'm getting out until I get out. And I'm counting the days, starting from 10 back, and now I'm at five and I just can't wait. Very good. Well, thanks for talking with us today. I hope you've had a good time. I did. It was fun. The guest you just heard was starting to find her voice by expressing herself through writing, and this made a difference in her attitude and self-esteem. She didn't start by writing poems. She started by expressing her feelings. I helped her shape her words into lines and stanzas. All of the imagery and the emotion is hers. I say to anyone listening, just give it a try. See what happens. And remember the one rule I have with my students? Don't throw anything you write away. Because if it comes from you, it has value. You heard themes of numbness and fear, and the anger she expressed was due to bottling things up and feeling unheard. I encourage youth to let it out, and hope through this program they will be heard and feel empowered. What also comes through in her story in a clear and disturbing fashion is this simple fact. Children are vulnerable. Youth are impressionable. Minors are corruptible. They need the love, guidance, and protection of adults. Lives can be forever changed by trauma. Young people should not have to fear adults, but sadly, too many adults are failing in their responsibility. And it's not only at home as parents, it's at school as administrators and teachers and at work as bosses and managers, and in the community as neighbors and friends. Abuse of any sort can't be tolerated. Teens need our help, not our judgment. For first-time listeners, Teen Centric is about teens and features interviews with teens. In addition to talking with them about their lives, all of them are writing poetry and they will recite their poems. I teach poetry at a number of locations in the county, and many of the kids I work with are at risk and struggling in their lives. I will interview other adults who, like myself, work with teens in some capacity with the goal of gaining a greater understanding of the issues they face and how to be helpful. Thank you for listening today. Teen Centric is a partnership of the Ventura County Arts Council, CAPS Radio, and the Ventura County Probation Agency. We receive support from the California Arts Council's Jump Starts program, and our poetry books are published with help from the Ventura County Office of Education. And I do want to acknowledge my collaborator, Kenny Dredd, who puts music behind the poems that my students recite. He works with a sound library from DeWolf, and CAPS Radio pays a license fee to use that music. Opinions expressed on this program may not necessarily reflect those of KPPQLP Ventura.